have your Bibles with me when you turn to Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 17. Mark 10, starting at verse 17. It's the story of the rich young man, the rich young rulers, called in different translations. Hear the word of God. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Here ends the reading of God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. But I want to tell you what an honor it is to be invited back here to Milton to speak with you this afternoon. I've had the privilege to speak at a number of Jeremiah Cry events and into my pockets. Oh, I don't like preaching stuff in my pockets. <laughs> um, probably at least over a half a dozen times. I spoke here last year, and I recognize a lot of faces here in the audience, even uh, Paul Taylor, a good friend of mine who uh, used to work with Eric down in Pensacola. He just came out with a book, by the way. It's called Only Believe. And it's a presuppositional book. I quit my job. One of the reasons was to write a book. And I haven't yet. Everyone else is writing presuppositional books, and Paul Taylor is one of them. And, and he, I don't know, was crazy enough to allow me to write the uh, foreword for this book. And Paul, I just read the preface, and I want to thank you for the kind words that you said about me in the preface. And I just thought you knew me better. <laughs> but uh, it's a great book, presuppositional. I encourage people to uh, pick that up. It was great because I, I turned on Highway 29, I drove down from Canada, and I turned the radio on, and I hear Janet Mefford, and who was the guest on her show? Paul Taylor. It was, it was really cool. Familiar voice. Now, you may have noticed that my topic today is presuppositional apologetics. And um, as uh, Bobby said, you know, he's heard me probably about 20 times. Now, all the other speakers have interesting topics, but mine is the usual presuppositional apologetics. Why is that? Well, basically, that's all I speak on. See, as long as I remember, I can remember I've had a desire to share my faith. But as many of you know, most of my life I was doing it wrong. By the grace of God, about 12 years ago, I was introduced to presuppositional apologetics, and almost eight years ago, I quit my job to start teaching it full time. Now, I've never had the desire to pastor a church. That's an incredibly tough job. You see, along with all their other duties, pastors have to prepare a different sermon every week, sometimes more than one sermon every week. They have to have a lot to say. And, brothers and sisters, I don't have a lot to say. See, early in my ministry, I was contacted by a fellow who uh, informed me that Phil Johnson was unable to speak at a conference in Norway. He had some emergency or something that he was unable to go to that engagement. And this fellow asked me to take Phil Johnson's place. This was early in my ministry. And then he went on to say that they had asked Phil to speak, uh, do eight exegetical verse-by-verse -verse sermons you know, during this conference. And I said to him, you got the wrong guy. You see, I don't have that much to say. So they got someone else. And they haven't asked me again, but sadly. See, the reason I quit my job eight years ago to go into full-time ministry was not because I had a lot to say. Quite basically, I quit my job because I had a few things that I wanted to say to a lot of people. Still, though, I would have loved to go to Norway. See, from what I understand about Norway, not only are they in need of a biblical apologetic, they're in need of solid reform teaching. See, I know that Brother Tony Miano had been to Norway a number of times, and I was hoping that one year I could jump on his coattails and uh, be asked to speak at a conference in Norway. But that wasn't of a, uh, in course until uh, Tony blew up Norway. <laughs> now, for any of you that don't know what it is to blow up a place, just imagine you know, being billeted at some place that has completely different views than you, and you say the wrong thing. Well, Tony stuck to the truth of Scripture, and uh, he blew up Norway. And um, I'm reminded of my friend, uh, dear friend Jeff Durbin, who uh, was in here last year, 
and he called everybody in attendance uh, coffee-drinking Calvinists. And there was some squirming going on in the seats, and judging by the squirming, uh, I came to realize that not everyone in attendance was a coffee drinker. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when is Jeff speaking? Jeff, there? oh no, he's not. No, I don't think he blew up Milton. I, he was probably just busy. <laughs> so I'm not a verse-by-verse -verse exegetical speaker. I'm an ex-factory worker. That has a few things that I want to say to a lot of people. See, that puts me in a bit of a dilemma because, I've, as I've said, most of what I want to say I've said to most of you here. See, Mike Stockwell has heard me enough, enough times that he uses my talks as a uh, chance to catch up on his sleep. And, um, <laughs> frank, frankly, I don't blame him. See, a lot of you have heard this talk countless times. But the problem is there's a few who have no idea what I'm talking about when I mention presuppositional apologetics. Now, Jeff Rose has very kindly told me many times not to worry about repeating myself. See, I'm told that repetition, repetition is a good way to learn. I'm told that repetition is a good way to learn. <laughs> but, you know, I have a theory on that. Um, I think most people actually forget what you say as soon as you, they walk out of the auditorium. See, last year I was at this very conference getting ready to speak, and the speaker before me was going along. And I was not exhibiting as much grace as I would have liked to, and I was pacing the halls there, and pacing the halls, and just going along, going along, and then finally everyone was let out. And they were assuring me that it was so good, that it was worth it, that it went long. And I, I get that. I was an ex, you know, I, I can understand that. that good. But I asked him this question. I said, what was the main point of his talk? You know, not one person could tell me. At the time, I asked him, well, what was the they couldn't tell me. I think people forget what you say as soon as they go out. So I think repetition is a good thing. At the risk of being too repetitive, though, for those who have no idea what a presuppositional uh, apologetics is, I will take a few minutes to introduce it to you. But for the remainder of my time, I've decided to take a different approach. Rather than repeat a few things that I want to say to a lot of people, I've decided to say a few things that I don't want to say to a lot of people. A few things that I don't want to say to you. But first, presuppositional apologetics. I trust that by now most of you are familiar with the term apologetic from the Greek apologia, which means to give a, a reasoned defense of the truth of your faith, a reasoned defense of Christianity. It does not mean to go around saying you're sorry, although many Christians should probably be going around saying they're sorry for the way we've been defending your faith. But more on that later. How do most people defend their faith when a person says they don't believe in God? Well, they give evidence. Now, don't get me wrong, evidence is a wonderful gift from God to declare His majesty. But where do we hear evidence most often out in the world? We hear it in the court of law. Who do we give evidence to in court? The judge, or the judge and the jury. So when an unbeliever comes up to you and says they don't believe in God, and we give them evidence, who are we saying is the judge? Them. And who's on trial? The Lord of glory. We elevate the unbeliever to the position of judge, and we put God in the criminal's box. Scripture time after time calls the unbeliever a fool. And what do most Christians do? What are we taught to do? We make them the judge. It's not a fool in the name-calling sense, disparaging their intellect, but in a moral sense for the utter rejection of that which they know to be true. That which they know to be true. That might be a shock to a lot of you. I remember that one of the first times I taught this, I asked for a show of hands. How many people know that the Bible teaches that everyone actually knows that God exists? <coughs> well, let me read to you from Romans, the first chapter, starting at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what, be, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they came futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. See, it's not the brilliant philosopher, the scholarly scientist, or the amazing atheist who says in his heart there is no God. It's the fool. Psalm 14.1. I learned last year from Earl Blackburn, I don't know if it was at this conference or at another conference that I attended with him, 
But he actually said that the best translation from the Hebrew is that the fool says in his heart, no God for me. Hmm. I can't tell you how many times I read that passage in Romans, believed it, and went out and basically ignored what it was saying. You see, brothers and sisters, when we defend our faith, we're not dealing with innocent bystanders. We're dealing with rebels. God says that they know he exists, and they call him a liar. And we pay no attention to it. As Tony often says, and I will not play a defense attorney in their blasphemous courtroom. Now, Tony's always very kind to me on his show. He tells me how much he's learned from me and stuff. Brother, I've learned a lot from you. You do that example quite often, and I thank God for that. But I want you to do me a favor. When someone asks you, when someone says to you that they don't believe in God because of a lack of evidence, ask them this. Would you, would you worship God if I satisfied your demand for evidence? Mm -hmm. If I gave you sufficient evidence on your terms to believe in God, would you worship Him? You'd be surprised at how many people say no. See, two fellows in particular told myself and Eric Holman, my friend from Pensacola, on a podcast that they wouldn't worship God, even if we satisfy their demand for evidence. One went so far as to call God a psychopath. Of course, he would have no basis for calling anyone a psychopath according to his worldview, but that's beside the point. But clearly the issue was not that he didn't believe in God. It was that he hated him. They hated him. Unbelievers hate God. That's what it says in Romans. They're God haters. Now, we're going to talk about the college ministry, and a lot of times we'll get people say, no, I don't hate God. I'm just kind of indifferent to him. You know, I, I don't really care, but I don't hate him. How do you answer a question like that? Well, it's nice to read in Scripture, you know, that calls them God-haters. But this is a scenario that I've used, and then maybe you can use it when you're talking to these people who say they don't hate God. And it happens quite often on the college campus. So you're, a student here, you're a student here at, the, uh, at this college. So now, I don't know if your parents paid for you, but I want you to imagine that your parents paid for your tuition. And you went home for spring break, and you went to your nice home, and your parents were eager for you at the front door, waiting for you to come home. They opened the door, you walked in, you took one look at them, you said, who are you? They said, were your parents? Well, you know, I, I probably have parents, I think I have parents, but I just don't think you're them. I don't think you're my parents. Tell you what, you can stay here the night. I'm going to my room now, but if you're here in the morning, I'm calling the cops. Now, you might be very indifferent towards your parents. But how does that look to your parents? Why does my child hate me? And I think that's exponentially worse what you're doing to your Heavenly Father who's giving you the next breath in your lungs. And you're saying, oh, there could be something out there. Because you think you don't hate him, but your attitude towards him is one of hatred. Mm -hmm. Because you're denying the God that gave you, like I say, every breath. You know, the interesting thing about those two fellows, though, is that they would not let me back on their podcast unless I did what? Gave them. Mm -hmm. Argue evidence with them. My first one-on-one -on -one radio debate was with a fellow named Paul Bear. He was told who he'd be engaging about a month prior. He'd been to my website. He knew exactly where I was coming from. In his opening remarks, he said that it was not about the evidence. He said that even if he had affidavits from the Roman guards who witnessed the resurrection crucifixion of Christ, he would not believe it. If he had affidavits from the Roman guards, he wouldn't believe it. What did I find Paul Baird arguing with Christians about in the forums after our debate? Evidence for the resurrection. And Christians were engaging. If he had affidavits from the Roman guards, he wouldn't believe it. And Christians were engaging him. What a colossal waste of time, brothers and sisters. Now, do I love evidence for the resurrection? Of course I do. Why? Because I'm a Christian. You see, I don't argue evidences with the unbeliever. I'm not an evident, an evidentialist. I'm a presuppositionalist. Now, the easiest way that I found to explain that is I want you to imagine a fossil. If I put a fossil here, the unbeliever looks at that fossil and says millions of years. The Christian looks at that same very fossil and says, no, it's flat. Same evidence, different conclusions. Could be brilliant people on both sides of the argument. PhDs. Same evidence, different conclusions. Why? Not because of the evidence, but because of the beliefs they take to the evidence. Their pre-beliefs, their foundational beliefs. What are they called? That's their presuppositions. So I don't argue evidences with people, I argue the presuppositions. How do I do apologetics? 
Well, God and his word are our presuppositions. I don't give them up when I engage the unbeliever. Now, this is uh, an unbeliever on Facebook was trying to insult me in one of the forums. And this is what he wrote. Sai, I have watched you on YouTube. I have watched you in discussion. I have visited your website. I have briefly engaged you here in this discussion forum. In every single instance, you have flatly refused to engage in any discussion whatsoever which does not comport with your own presuppositions. And I think, praise God. <laughs> That's one of the nicest compliments I've ever received. And he was using it as an insult. I mean, that's the state of how we defend our faith. Yeah, that an unbeliever would consider insulting. And I said to him, man, can I quote you on this? And he said, no. But I don't mention his name, but I do quote him. See, I gave a talk the day before the Atheistic Reason Rally a couple years back entitled, Apologetics is Easy. Believe your Bible. It's that simple. Read your Bible, believe what it says, do what it says. Jesus said, for I will give you a mouth of wisdom with which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand to contradict. Luke 21, 15. It is the gospel which is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1, 16. You know, it's, it's interesting. Listen to the pre previous speaker. It's amazing how God does this. But we all, always seem to be on the same page when we come to a conference like this. We're not really given, you know, what we have to speak on. But we're all talking about the same thing. I think we're all brought to the same place. It's the gospel which is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. Brothers and sisters, salvation is, was, and always will be of the Lord. See, I don't speak of it often, especially, you know, the further south I go. <laughs> but that's why presuppositional apologetics is distinctly reformed apologetic. See, we as reformed folk understand that salvation is of the Lord. That the only thing we contribute to our salvation, I believe it was Paul Washer who said the <coughs> following. The only thing that we contribute to our salvation is a sin which makes it necessary. All Christians really do believe this though. Ask any Christian, what makes you different from the lost? What you did or what Jesus did? They'll tell you the difference between them and the lost is what Jesus did. Now the problem is, when you then ask them, if Jesus did the same for everyone. And they'll tell you yes. Brothers and sisters, if Jesus did the same for everyone, everyone would be saved. See, this is a question I asked on Twitter a few weeks ago. Why isn't everyone saved if Jesus did the same for everyone and what he did for you saved you? This is a question that I ask those who say that Jesus did the same for everyone. Is your salvation like you drowning in the lake? Would you say that all you're doing is grabbing onto the rope? You'd say, oh, I didn't contribute to my salvation. If that rope wasn't there, if that boat wasn't there, I would be dead. It's still 100% the rescuer. All I'm doing is grabbing onto the rope. I say, is that basically what you believe your salvation is like? And they say, yes. I say, here's the problem with that scenario. Imagine that you were drowning the lake beside your friend who's drowning the lake. <clears throat> And now the rescue boat comes out and throws out two ropes. You grab on, and your friend doesn't. What's the difference between you and your friend? What you did, or what the rescuer did? If that is the scenario, the difference between you and the lost is 100% what you did, and zero of what the rescuer did. That's why in the end it's a wicked doctrine. Denying Christ his due. This is the question I ask people. I say, if, you're, if, if it's you grabbing on the rope, give me one non-boastable reason for grabbing that rope. I wanted it more. I was smarter than that person. I can't think of one reason for grabbing that rope that the person couldn't be up in heaven looking down and boasting. But there is no boasting because salvation is of the Lord. You see, what happens in evidential apologetics is we're giving the unbeliever evidences and arguments to try and convince them to grab the rope. The problem is we're not drowning in the lake. We're dead at the bottom of the lake. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says that before we were saved, we were dead in our transgression and sins. The dead <coughs> cannot grab a rope. The dead cannot choose life. Surely you'd say that it was pleasing to God when a person is saved. Romans 8.8 8 says those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And these are people who want to say that their salvation was something that they did to please God. 
Well, according to Scripture, how is a person saved? Luke 13, 3. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Acts 3, verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation. Repent, repent, repent. Amen. Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Acts 16, 31. And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Repent and believe over and over again in Scripture. Now here's the question. How does a person repent? Is repentance something you say, something you think, or something you do? I want to ask for a show of hands because usually when I do, people get that wrong and I don't want to embarrass anyone. Is repentance something you say, something you think, or do? Well, repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. Brothers and sisters, repentance is something you think. But if you change what you think, it'll change what you say and change what you do. It is actually all three. But it starts with a change of mind. Repentance is something you think. Now here's the next question. How do you change what you think about God? I ask this question on the streets too sometimes. How do you change what you think about God? And then I tell them, you can't. You're commanded to repent. You're commanded to change what you think about God. But you can't. Lest you could boast. If there was something that you could do, then you could boast, then you could earn it, but you can't. You see, brothers and sisters, repentance is the gift of God. Amen. Acts 5.31, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Amen. Acts 11.18, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. 2 Timothy 2, 24-26 And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Mm -hmm. Repentance is a gift. Amen. Amen. What about belief? How does one believe? Philippians 1, 29 For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Um. Belief is a gift. Repentance is a gift. What are we trying to do? Give evidence so that the person will see the truth and repent. The Bible tells us that they must first be granted repentance before they can see the truth. We have it exactly backwards. We try to reason them into heaven with evidences rather than confront them with the truth of Scripture, rather than preach the gospel to them. Sadly, I've seen the same thing with people who become presuppositionalists. Mm -hmm. You see, we don't argue evidence with the person. We argue for hours and hours on end about logic or epistemology, the theory of knowledge, rather than simply declaring to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We try to argue with them to convince them what Scripture says they already know. Mm -hmm. Here's a question that I've been often asked, though. What about the people of other faiths? What about Mormons, Muslim, Jehovah's Witness? Do they know the God? How do you witness to them as a presupposition? Brothers and sisters, there's two worldviews. God and not God. I deal with them exactly the same way. And the sad thing about this is, is that there's many well-known, brilliant apologists who engage these people of other faiths and they do not confront them with the truth of what Scripture says, that they know the God. If you're about to witness to a Mormon, just about to witness to him and he gets hit by a bus. Does anybody think that that Mormon has an excuse when he stands before God? Mm -hmm. No. Why not? Because they already know. They know the God that is suppressing truth and unrighteousness. I would love for these people to tell them that they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness about the God and then dismantle their world. You see, I don't need, I don't need reassurances from that outside of Scripture because I know that's what Scripture teaches. But I was in England, I was at a church, and there were two ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. And both of them said to me, as a Jehovah's Witness, they knew that what they were believing was false. They knew it. Now, I go up to the Jehovah's Witness on the street, I know that you know this is false. 
I know that you know it. And then I might go through some verses with them. But what's going to stick with them when they're sitting at home? They're 70 yards down the path. When they're lying there, dead. At the foot of a bloodstained cross. They know. They know. And that's what's going to be sticking with them. That's what I do with people of other faiths. Sure, I might dismantle their worldview, but I tell them that they know the God. They have sufficient knowledge of the God for their condemnation, not for their salvation. That's why we preach the gospel to them. Now, I don't often get into this, but this is one of the differences between, in the reform camp, between presuppositionalists and people who are not presuppositionalists. It's the idea of knowledge in Romans chapter 1. The difference between immediate knowledge and immediate knowledge. Now, I'm a fact marker. I had no idea that there was a difference between immediate knowledge and immediate knowledge. What are you talking about? Well, I heard Dr. Bonson, Dr. Greg Bonson, who I learned most of my apologetic from. He was saying, imagine your wife walks in the room and you look and you say, oh, there's a woman. She's 5'7". Uh, that's her hair. Those are her eyes. That's her nose. That's my wife. <laughs> no. Your wife walks in the room and you go, oh, there's my wife. You know it immediately. Now, it's not a perfect analogy because there is some mediation, but it's instant. Dr. Bonzo says the knowledge that we have of God in Romans 1 is immediate. That's why we're without excuse. Because if it was immediate, if you had to go through all these things in nature to conclude God, you can make a mistake. I thought it was Allah. I thought it was Vishnu. No. We have immediate knowledge of God. Everyone does. Even the Jehovah's Witness, even the Mormon, even the Muslim. Immediate knowledge of God. But the thing is, they're a lot better at fooling us into believing that they don't know that God. We talk about that with the atheist all the time. No, you know the God that exists. How many times have you heard somebody say that to a Muslim? To a Mormon? To a Jehovah's Witness? Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to do it. And hopefully that's what God will use to save them. Confront them with the truth of Scripture. Know what they know. It will change the way you defend your faith. Well, that's basically some of the few things that I want to say to a lot of people. A bit of a different approach to presuppositional apologetics. But one of the reasons is... Because I'm going to tell you now the few things that I don't want to say to a lot of people. <clears throat> I can't stand most of the open air preaching I hear. Can't stand it. And I'm not talking about the stuff I see on YouTube. That is granted that I can't stand most of that. I'm talking about the stuff that I hear in my own rooms. I can't stand it. I'm saddened by how harsh it is. See, when I hear that, though, I'm very reluctant to speak up. Now, why is that the case? Well, one, I'm an ex-factory worker. And I think, who am I to criticize that person? Another reason is that I was born in a Christian home. You know, you heard Bobby talking about that. And I don't know what it's like to walk the earth and reject Jesus Christ. I'm not saying that I was born a Christian. You know, I, people criticize me of that. And I say, oh, when did you start loving your mother? I say, I don't know. I guess you don't love your mother then. But, um, so, you know, I, I don't know what it's like... To, to walk the earth and reject Jesus Christ. Most of the people in my group do. So when they're up there berating the unbeliever for their sin, I'm thinking, maybe that's what they needed to hear when they were unbelievers. So I'm very reluctant to, to correct them. See, when I level the criticism that I'm going to level, I want to do with this caveat. I could be wrong. But I want you to hear me out. See, I rem I'm reminded of a time that I was handing out tracks with my good friend Elvis Kesto. And he took one of these tracks and he put it on the ground. And I said, brother, I'm all with you about handing out, out tracks, but I think that's literary. He said, I was saved by a track that I found on the ground. <laughs> I said, go for it. <laughs> so I'm going to say some stuff here, and like I say, maybe it's the very thing you need to hear, and I probably won't be saying anything out in the street. But I could be too critical, but still, I want you to hear me out. As I read in 2 Timothy 2, 24, 26, the Lord's servant must not quarrel, Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. Now, as some of you know, it's probably interesting that you see me talking like this, is that one of the criticisms most often level at me is how unloving I am to the lost. Now, I'd argue that the criticism is without merit. However, I do sympathize with those who get that impression from my interaction. And if it looks unloving to some, it's quite possible that I'm doing it wrong. <coughs> Often the case is that the hottest part of my interaction is what makes it onto YouTube or into one of the films. See, the person doesn't see the other hour that I spend with them sharing the gospel and they end up giving me a hug before they leave. But when that's not the case, the explanation I give is that I'm not interested in calling people into hell. 
Indeed, I do believe it's the better friend who yells a warning of a cliff ahead than the one who invites him to a pizza social. I realize, though, that I'm not immune to the very criticism I'm leveling. Perhaps that gives me some kind of expertise on the subject. See, clearly I'm not a Bible scholar. But when I read scripture, I look for the out. I look for the passages where Jesus or his disciples treated the unbeliever harshly. No doubt I've used some of these passages in defending my own position. While Jesus chased the moneylenders out of the temple with a whip. While Jesus called the scribes and fairies the brood of vipers, blind fools, hypocrites, whitewashed tombs. Paul said that he wished the agitators within the church would emasculate themselves. One common thread among all the rebukes and mocking by Jesus and the disciples was that it was with people within the church. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 12, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Brothers and sisters, we are in the church. And what do we do? We go to the university campus, the Super Bowl, the abortion clinic, and judge people outside the church. We rebuke people outside the church. We rebuke sinners for sinning. We go to homosexual parades and rebuke homosexuals for behaving like homosexuals. We go to abortion clinics and rebuke murderers at heart for behaving like murderers. We rebuke liars for lying. Don't get me wrong. I get it. I get the desire for the unbeliever to repent. I get the anger over spitting in the face of God. I get it. The problem is nowhere in scripture have I seen Jesus or the disciples rebuking non-believers for their behavior. Now I'm open to correction. But I see rebuking of people within the church. Brothers and sisters, rebuking an unbeliever for sinning is like rebuking a dog for barking. Or a cow for giving milk. You're a liar! Of course you're a liar! But brothers and sisters, dogs are not dogs because they bark. Dogs bark because they are dogs. That's one reason that I'm not crazy about the good person test, by the way. Have you ever told a lie? Of course they've told a lie. Have you ever stolen anything? What does that make you? A thief. No. Stealing does not make a person a thief. People steal because they're thieves at heart. I get it. If you're trying to have a quiet conversation, your dog is barking beside you, you may, you may rebuke that dog for barking. But if you go to the kennel and rebuke the dog for barking, that doesn't make sense. Who goes to the dairy farm and rebukes the cows for giving milk? You're a liar. You're a murderer. You're an adulterer at heart. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, when the rich young ruler approached Jesus and said, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth, was he lying? Of course he was. As John MacArthur said, every word out of this man's mouth was blasphemy. He had a different God. His God was money. His God was his possessions. And what did Jesus say to him? You're a liar! You're a liar! You're a liar! You're a liar! You're a blasphemer! No. Jesus loved him. You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. In a recent article entitled, The Law Should Not Be Central in Your Preaching, our brother Tony Miano writes, With over a decade of street preaching under my belt, <coughs> I have seen people time and time again, through the use of the law, humbled when brought to the realization that their sin is exceedingly sinful to the God before whom they will stand to give an account for their lives. At the same time, I have also seen a 90% law, 10% grace, law and gospel presentation can leave people emotionally shredded, angry, without hope, and not a step closer to Christ than they were before the conversation or open-air interaction began. I have also seen how proud and arrogant an open-air preacher can not only sound, but actually be when evangelistically presenting a 90% law, 10% grace, gospel, or message. I added that last word, sorry, Tony. This is still Tony Wright. Who are you talking about, Tony? Give us names. Okay, I'll give you one name. The name of one man who has made the before-mentioned mistake, Tony Miano. That's our brother Tony writing, and he, he continues. Without intending to, as I began my ministerial life as an open-air preacher, the law of God quickly became my, central in my gospel preaching. I thought I was making much of Christ, but I was making more of man's sin than the remedy for his sin. I preached the gospel, but I was not lifting the name of Jesus anywhere near as high as I should. 
I am nobody. I don't think I've earned the right to critique my brother, but Tony gets it. I've seen him go through that transition. You cannot be on the streets as long as Tony has with a right heart and not get it. Notice I said with a right heart. There are many who have been on the streets as long or longer than Tony who don't get it. I know that Tony gets it because his heart is in the right place. I'm so thankful that God has placed Tony in the place of mentorship over young, or at least new, open-air preachers. You see, brothers, <coughs> it's utter futility to try to get unbelievers to behave like believers. Yes, we need to point out the disease. But brothers and sisters, please, 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 be about the cure. You want to hashtag something, Tony, be about the cure. <laughs> 10% disease, 90% cure. How's that? See, if someone happens upon your encounter with an unbeliever and it does not look like you want them to be saved, you're probably doing it wrong. Do not seek to win the argument. Seek to win the person. The argument is already won. Especially with presuppositional apology. The argument is won. Now, of course, we realize that we cannot win the person, but that should be our goal. The Holy Spirit uses us to save these people. See, we are coffee drinking reform folk. I eat iced coffee. It is Jesus Christ who through the work of his Holy, through his Holy Spirit that wins the person. But the Holy Spirit does not work in a vacuum. He uses people like you and me to win people. Now, often you'll get the you know criticism as reform people, you know, if God has predestined, we'll be saved and we'll be lost. Why do you even evangelize? It doesn't make sense for reform people. This is a conference about evangelism. About us reform folk going out to evangelize. But this is the question that I ask you. <clears throat> does God know if you're going to have a full stomach when you put your head down on your pillow tonight? Yes, He does. Why do you eat? God knows you're going to have a full stomach. Why do you eat? You eat because that is the means that God uses to fill your stomach. God knows who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. Why do we evangelize? Because God condescends to use us worms in saving people. He doesn't have to do that. God can fill our stomach miraculously. He can save people without us, but he condescends to use us in his plan. What a glorious God we serve that he would use even the likes of us. Okay. See, recently I was called, uh, I, I went to what is called one of the most liberal universities in America. As usual, most of my fellow preachers were calling out the behavior of unbelievers and winning arguments. And I grieved. See, I confess that some of the reason I grieved is that some of what I heard coming out of the mouths of my brothers is some of what they learned from me. My favorite sign to carry when I preach anywhere now when I preach at that university, a sign that has one word on it. The word is love. I had some of the best conversations I had on the tour with some of the vilest hecklers coming up to me because they wanted to ask me questions when I was holding that sign. <coughs> See, I sat a bit away from the preaching, probably appearing a little dejected. Because I was. I remember one fellow in particular, his name was Liam. <coughs> the reason I remember him is that while I was preaching, when the preaching was going on, he was sitting there, off to the side, with his shirt off, and one of the vilest things painted on his chest, with a vile saying that went along with it. And he came up to me, it was probably a couple hours later, and he sat down, and he had a question for me. And I said, you know, he was talking about how vile the people were in the audience there. And I said, yeah, some of them even take off their shirt and paint vile things on them with awful slogans. And he looked at me and said, oh, he knows. <laughs> I was one of them. But he talked with me. We had a wonderful conversation. Because I didn't come there to rebuke him. I came there to love him, to love the lost. I mean, I wasn't going to talk about this, but the thing is, the scripture, God does not love everyone salvifically. He does not love everyone salvifically. Because if he, does, if he did, I would not have to go to that campus. So I get the objection. I cannot stand. A lot of my Reformed brothers can stand on the box and say, God loves you. And they'll say they're talking about common grace. And I can't do that. I can stand up there and say, God is love. So when I hold a sign that says love, I'm not saying that God loves you. But I'm commanded to love them. I'm commanded to love my enemy. I'm commanded to love them. Now people take the logical uh, step from saying God does not love everyone, therefore I don't have to. That's not the logical step. The logical step that God does not love everyone salvifically is that God does not love everybody salvifically. Not that you don't have to. Because God knows it hurt. You don't. 
I don't. I'm commanded to love the vilest of the vile. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to do when we go to these campuses. You know, brothers and sisters, Jesus said in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice. He did not say, my sheep hear sighs really good argument. Jesus did not say, my sheep hear your really good argument. Mm -hmm. My sheep hear my voice. The Bible tells us that there are two types of people, sheep and goats. Mm -hmm. The sheep are those who end up being saved and the goats are those who are damned. One thing that's interesting about the sheep and goats in Scripture, sheep do not become goats. Nowhere in Scripture. Jesus did not say, my goats become sheep. <clears throat> he said, my sheep hear my voice. The problem is we don't know who the sheep and goats are. Yeah. We preach promiscuously. We treat them all like sheep. But you don't change the message to try and convert goats. It's not our job to go out to these campuses or wherever we're preaching and berate goats for being goats. We're to go out and call home the sheep. <coughs> I often tell the story of a presuppositional apologist, apologist who, without giving a lecture, called How to Argue with an Atheist and Win. A woman came up to one of the speak to the speaker afterwards and said, You know, I don't think God is very pleased when we go around winning arguments. The speaker responded, Ma'am, I think God is a whole lot less pleased when we go around losing. I love that line. I really do. But I get the complaint. Brothers and sisters, the argument is one. Jesus' sheep will hear his voice. Seek to win the soul, not the argument. Amen. Look like you want them to be saved. If someone happens to cross your conversation and it does not look like you want them to be saved, you're probably doing it wrong. When you're out there, stop. Take some stock. Ask yourself, how is my attitude right now best described? Angry. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Plenty of young people learning this apologetic, watch the film, come up and say, well, I did pre-sup on that guy. I nailed him. I did pre-sup on him. I said, don't ever tell me that again. I, I get what they're saying. I get it. You know, I've already said stuff like that. Tell me you honored Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what this apologetic is, brothers and sisters. It's not, you are sick, you are sick, you are sick. No. It's, this is healthy. He is healthy. Point them to our Lord. As my good friend Dustin Seeger says, make Jesus sweet to them. When Jesus engaged the lost, he had mercy on them. He healed them. He fed them. Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are labor, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Brothers and sisters, when you go out and preach, be about the cure. Be about the cure. Amen. Make Jesus sweet. Amen. Amen. Lord God, I thank you for this time where I could share with my brothers for using even me, Lord God, for such an important task. Lord God, I ask that you allow the words that you wanted them to hear to stick within them, Lord God, and to stay with them when they engage the loss, and that they might forget anything that I've said, Lord God, which is incorrect. Thank you for this conference, Lord God, for the souls who are attending here for the desire to represent you accurately, Lord God. We love you, and we ask that you help us to seek, to seek to serve you in all that we say and do and think and are. We thank you for your Son and your Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord, and we praise your most holy name. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name.